Okay, so my job today is to convince you that the history of ancient DNA research can be characterized as a history of celebrity science. So brief background for my PhD project, my research question is, how has ancient DNA research evolved from an emergent into a more or less established techno-scientific practice? And to answer the question, my research methods are traditional historical research methods, but I have the added approach of oral history. So I've interviewed over 50 scientists and students who work in and around the field of ancient DNA, and I'm using their stories to help me write my history. These scientists come from the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and then all across Europe. So first, what is ancient DNA research? Well, it's the extraction of DNA from fossils, and it's a contemporary, interdisciplinary, and controversial research practice that began in the 1980s. So ancient DNA research emerged from the interface of paleontology, archaeology, and molecular biology. And over the past three decades, it's developed into what looks like a discipline. However, I want to argue that it's developed under the influence of intense public interest and extreme media expo exposure. So while ancient DNA has, yes, developed into a techno science, it's also developed into what I want to call a celebrity science. So what is celebrity science? Um, this is a new concept about a subject of science that I've created based off of my synthesis of the literature and my analysis of all the interviews. Um, it's still under construction, but I want to say that it's a subject of science that has constant news value and receives consistent media attention. This media attention is so substantial that it influences the science itself to the extent that the scientists involved respond positively and negatively to the media attention, and they even reinvent their reputation and that of the overall science that's important accordingly. So what's the argument? Well, today the argument is that I'm going to say that ancient DNA research can be characterized as a celebrity science, and then I want to discuss the celebrity science concept in more detail, and I could use your help here. And then I want to suggest that ancient DNA and its existence as a celebrity science could be interpreted as a cause and consequence of paleontology's popularization. And here I can use your help too. So first, ancient DNA research as a celebrity science. Yep, it is. So the story today is going to start in the 1980s when a team of researchers in California extracted and sequenced DNA from the museum remains of Equus Quaga a zebra-like relative of the horse reported to have gone extinct over 140 years ago. Now for scientists, this is really exciting because it was the first time, one of the first times, that scientists had extracted DNA from something dead. So for professionals, it was a way that we could reach into evolutionary history, we could recover it using DNA. But for the press and the public, and to be fair, some professionals, it was a way that we could bring back the past, that we could bring back extinct creatures. So the first point I want to make is that ancient DNA has a news value for the media. One researcher said this, the media love ancient DNA, they love it. Usually the key question is about cloning. It probably goes right back to the earlier days when we first got mammoth DNA. The press seemed to have such a short memory. We went through all this nine months ago, you rang me up with the same question, and they'll print it again, they'll print it again. So the point is that there's news value but it's constant news value that receives consistent attention. However, news value cuts both ways. There's benefits for the science and the scientists too. A different researcher said, with ancient DNA, you just have to say mammoth, Neanderthal, and people want to hear more. Because of that, any story you have to tell could be a cover picture of a big journal. So that was a booster for many in terms of getting full professorship really fast and getting access to really amazing samples. So here we see that the news value means there's a, a mutual interest for both journalists to engage and both scientists. So in the 1990s, this happened. Jurassic Park, the book, and the movie. And it's during this decade that scientists witnessed the race for the most ancient DNA from the most iconic fossils. My interviewees call it the Wild West. They call it the Jurassic Park race. And it's during this decade, the 1990s, that I want to argue that the influence of the media, and Jurassic Park specifically, is most evident. 
And I'll give you just one example, sadly, of that evidence. So in 1993, a team of researchers, also from California, but a different team, claimed to have extracted and sequenced the oldest DNA to date. This was 135 million year old DNA from an extinct weevil in Lebanese amber. And Nature published the results on June 10th of 1993. This date's important because it was the day after the Jurassic Park movie premiere and the day before its public release in movie theaters across the United States. And the publication time caused a huge media splash. One interviewee who was around during this time and remembered the event said this, I thought it absolutely extraordinary that a scientific journal like Nature would hold on to an article to wait for the opening day of a movie. That caused a huge media splash. So this is just one example of the interplay between science and the media. And what I want to argue is evidence for what we can think of as the forming of a celebrity science. Um, I have other examples that show connections between um, grant money, especially here in the UK, a really huge site for ancient DNA, and at the Natural History Museum. And there's also other examples for researcher recruitment and the connection between there. But I want to go ahead and jump to how do we make sense of this relationship? What does it mean? Why does it matter? So one researcher explained the relationship to me in these terms. You've got to separate the ancient DNA researchers' need for the press and the press's need for ancient DNA. The press loves ancient DNA. It's on stories that are attractive to the public. When they've got nothing, they come to us. It'll be something interesting. We work on history, anthropology, archaeology, weird shit, dinosaurs, whatever. But the ancient DNA researchers, that's how they justify getting their money. That's how X gets his money, because the Y government wants to show that Y science is world class. How better to do that than have science report it? So, X gets that press, Y government is happy, give X more money. There are two points here. One, there is an interplay between science and media. Two, the researchers who work in and around ancient DNA are well aware of it, and they use it to their advantage. They capitalize on it. I don't want to say exploit, but they use it for the pragmatic purpose of furthering funding for other research and resources. Yes, they're educating, yes, they're entertaining the public, but they're also communicating very strongly to funding bodies, which is central to their existence. But at the end of the 1990s, something really interesting happens. So there are a series of studies that claimed multi-million-year-old DNA from a number of fossils. And these studies were published in Nature and Science and publicized across the mass media. However, all these studies were shown to have a problem, and it was called contamination. So the DNA wasn't ancient, authentic DNA. It was contaminated from other sources, sometimes the scientists themselves. And this led to a dramatic drop in the fate of ancient DNA as a way to study evolutionary history, as a way to study paleontology, archaeology, and so on. So researchers responded. And in particular, two researchers responded by an article published in Science called Ancient DNA, Do It Right or Not at All, where they list key criteria for doing the science or not at all. So obviously this is a response to contamination, but I also want to argue that it was a response to celebrity. One interviewee explained it this way. The problem that Jurassic Park produced was that other scientists started to lose faith in the credibility of ancient DNA. They were saying, ancient DNA work is rubbish. It wasn't really serious because it was so tied up in the media, so tied up in Jurassic Park. So here, I think it's clearly boundary work. But interestingly, it's boundary work on two fronts. So yes, they're responding to contamination, a very real techno-scientific issue that shouldn't be underestimated. But they are also responding to celebrity, another real social issue that hasn't been explored and also shouldn't be underestimated. So that was a brief glimpse of my evidence for celebrity science. If you have questions, please ask. Um, but I want to talk about the celebrity science concept. So what does it mean? Um, can it be useful? And how can we make it do work in other areas of paleontology? So what I'd want to do is I want to argue that celebrity science is a subject of science, or in this instance, with ancient DNA, it's a techno science that exists and evolves under the influence of intense public interest and extreme media exposure. 
the mass media is critical in constructing an image of that science for the public. But scientists participate in the process too. A celebrity science is the result of a relationship that is actively pursued and produced through the interaction of members of both science and media. So with this definition, I think we can break it down in two ways. We can talk about celebrity science in terms of its essence, and when we do that, we can ask questions like, why is there a constant news value? Why is there consistent media attention? But we can also talk about it in terms of it as a process. So we can ask, how is mass media critical to constructing an image of that science for the public? And then how is a relationship actively pursued and produced by members of both parties? So to explore celebrity science, I've had to inter interestingly go into celebrity studies, which is new literature, but there's a lot there. And in celebrity studies, the definition of celebrity and celebrity culture is debatable. However, there's one definition that I like, um, and Graham Turner says that celebrity is a genre of representation. Celebrity is a commodity that's traded by the promotions, publicity, and media industries. It's a cultural formation with a social function. However, celebrity science has a problem in the sense that celebrity studies focuses on the individual, and I'm talking about the group level, so I'm having a hard time making that jump. So some important points. I'm not talking about the individual, the celebrity scientist, which you might be familiar with characterizations of like Paul Sagan, um, Janet Brown has described Charles Darwin as a scientific celebrity of this time. I'm not talking about the individual. Celebrity science operates on the group level as a subject of science. However, we have problems with who or what functions as a celebrity. Is it the fossils? Is it the idea around the fossils? Is it the individuals or something else? Um, also, agency is always is problematic. So what I do want to use is a new book by Declan Fay called The New Celebrity Scientist as a jumping point to talk about celebrity science. So in this book, he profiles um, eight scientists, including Stephen Jay Gould, and calls them celebrity scientists, scientists who live both lives in science and the media. And what they says is making a celebrity scientist requires a four-step process. The last step, the fourth step, is the one I'm interested in for my concept. And they says that to make a celebrity science, you have a creation of a reputation that allows that person to speak not only on science, but on larger looming issues. So their reach and their role is broader than their domain of science. It's pervasive in other areas of society that people care about. Now this last step, Faye says, is the most important, but frustratingly is the most elusive and abstract. And he offers this quote to explain this point. As cultural critic Louis Menden explained, this is the way the star's personality intersects with history, so that there so that there is a perfect correspondence between the way the world happens to be and the way the star is. So I think what I want to suggest is that the last step of making a celebrity scientist can be the first step of making a celebrity science. It speaks to its news value, its immediate attention. There's something about it that lends itself to become a celebrity science. That doesn't mean it does, because there's a process that's involved, but I'm interested in what is it that gives these kind of organisms or gives the subject of science that kind of attention? My answer, I think, is that it's a long line of popularization. So the news value and the media attention around ancient DNA comes from a very long line of popularizing paleontology. I don't need to explain it to you because that's why we're here. But it also comes from a long line of popularizing archaeology and molecular biology. DNA is a cultural icon. And together, this is an explosive combination for the public interest. However, celebrity science's ability to be a celebrity science comes from a longer history of commercialization, um, from what scholars are calling today medialization, which is the increased coupling of science and media, and also, in other words, celebification, which means the pervasiveness of celebrity in everyday life. So I think this is an important historical context to 
consider too for explaining why this has happened. So when we talk about ancient DNA as a celebrity science and as a cause and consequence of paleontology's popularization, I think we also should consider these other movements um, and including the science communication movement, one of our interests today at the conference. So scholars said in the 1990s, in the last decade or so, scientists have been delivered a new commandment, thou shalt communicate. In the recent past, many scientists looked at the popularization of science as something that might damage their career. Now they have no less than a duty to communicate with the public about their work. So ancient DNA gives us a chance to look at the development of a discipline, but one that's developing under celebrity culture influences, modern media influences, and at a time when what it means a scientist to communicate to the public is rapidly evolving. So when we think about this, and in relation to ancient DNA, researchers and journalists often pivot around the idea of resurrection, the idea of de-extinction, and they often come back to this idea and image as a way to report their research to the public because it's familiar, it's a cultural icon, it gets attention and it gets the message across to some extent. However, today it's less about dinosaur DNA, it's more about mammoth de-extinction and bringing back the mammoth and making Pleistocene art in Siberia. This is a constant space where researchers and journalists can be to communicate their research. One scientist said, there's always going to be some level of celebrity science around trying to recreate extinct species. Because of that interest, they have more opportunities to communicate to the public, to popularize their work. Another said, I'm sure that there are amazing people in Aridophilus and Drosophila who are equally good communicators, but they don't get the opportunities because who the fuck cares about Aridophilus? <laughs> at least relative to dinosaurs, human genomes, or dogs. Now this has an effect on the type of the individual that's working in the science. One researcher in the field said, it's producing a weird type of scientist, a business type of scientist. People publishing in Nature and Science will be more likely to pick up a position at a university because the university wants a researcher who produces media attention. So here we come full circle to this movement of science communication. And I think when we look at a celebrity science, the people who are within it are in a particularly good position to popularize and do just that and reinforce the system. So I hope to have convinced you that ancient DNA research can be characterized as a history of celebrity science. Um, I hope I've convinced you that the celebrity science concept could be a useful one. And I want us to think about celebrity science and ancient DNA as a cause and consequence of paleontology's long history of popularization. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>